So welcome to this evening's celebration of the Liturgy of the Day. Uh, my name is Osho Bra. I'm one of the priests with the Dragonfly Sangha. Uh, I'm happy to be with you all here this evening. Uh, let us start by sharing the peace. May all beings awaken to that peace which is our true home. Let us take refuge. I take refuge in the ground of being within which I live and move and breathe. Let us make the accord. I take sanctuary in the heart of being, accepting all of my delusions in thought, word, or deed, born of ignorance, hatred, and greed. Let us give thanks. I give thanks for all beings, awakening to the interbeing of all nature. May my heart be open and my mind clear. May all be free from suffering and the causes of suffering, and may all come to know that peace which is beyond all understanding. Since it is the practice of enlightenment, that practice has no beginning. And since it is enlightenment within the practice, that realization has no end. So, this evening I wanted to talk a bit about ending suffering. Um, don't we always talk about that? Uh, and, and mindfulness and meditation a bit. And I, I wanted to start out by uh, sharing some mindfulness tools that I found online, uh, in case that's helpful for you. Um, so when we think of meditation, one of the first things that comes to mind, right, is a meditation cushion, right, a Zafu and Zabutan. Um, and I found a great one online uh, called the Walden Meditation Cushion. Um, it's a mere $245. Uh, it's endorsed by BuzzFeed, GQ. Uh, and Oprah, uh, so you know it's got to be good. Um, a mala, you know, similar to a mala I have here, or one on my wrist, this one here. Um, but a, a, a full mala like this, uh, I found an amazing uh, one handcrafted in Nepal. Uh, $299 for that mala. Um, beautiful uh, piece of, of, of art. Um, meditation robe. Now, I'll admit, I didn't know that meditation robes existed uh, at first. Um, I wear robes as, as a uh, part of my vestment as, as a priest, um, but there are meditation robes too. And I found an incredibly comfy looking meditation robe, very soft with a hood, um, $272. A few other items, uh, some, some wonderful Mainichi, uh, Byakudan, sandalwood incense, um, about $56. Uh, meditation timer um, called the Enzo meditation timer about $139 um, so this this will run you a bit uh, to get this right um, some bells uh, easily drop a hundred or two hundred dollars on a quality uh, singing bowl and then lastly a Buddha statue for your altar I found a, a wonderful uh, statue uh, artisan grade resin um, hand applied gold leaf finish um, a paltry $2,300. Now, I'm, <laughs> I'm obviously poking fun at these items, uh, and maybe I shouldn't, because they are very beautiful. Um, and honestly, a lot of these items, and I'll talk about this, you know, albeit less expensive ones, uh, can, can really enhance your practice. But my point in, in rattling off some of these items is that none of them, no matter how expensive, no matter how beautiful, no matter how many or, or how few of those items you have, uh, will make you more mindful and make you suffer less. In fact, spending all that money, and I didn't total it all up, but I imagine it would be probably upwards of $4,000 uh, for all of those items could actually lead to more suffering uh, because maybe you'd have to put them all on a credit card and now you have debt that you have to pay. Um, and here's the thing. I know that it's tempting to, to, to look for quick solutions, right? And because it's so often in our lives that we can have sort of quick fixes for things, you know, it's tempting to think that we can kind of buy our way 
um, toward ending our suffering and not suffering as much. I mean, we live in a world where if I have a headache, I can just take some ibuprofen. And within, you know, 15, 20 minutes, my headache's gone. Upset stomach, take a pill, right? Can help with indigestion. Problem with insects or mice, if I have rodents in my house, I can call someone and have them come out and boom, they can take care of it, right? Because we live in a very convenience and solution oriented world where, like I said, there's almost always a quick fix, even on our phones, right? We have our, our cell phones, um, you know, back when, when, uh, uh, Apple was first, uh, you know, launching the iPhone and the smartphones, they, they had that catchphrase. There's an app for that, right? Need directions to a restaurant. Well, there's an app for that. Pay your bills online, meet new people. Um, stay in touch with with old friends. Um, just a few taps, button uh, button clicks, you know. And these solutions are becoming more and more intuitive, right? Uh, they learn our preferences. They know our location. We can make customizations. But the whole thing here, the the economy of convenience, is really about getting what you want as quickly as possible and just the way you want it. But a lot of times, a lot of our problems and obstacles can't just go away, right? A lot of them can. If we have the right tools, you know, or throw enough money at them, sure, we can make them go away. But one problem that resists this trend of convenience and, and expedition is, is suffering, right? For thousands of years, we've been dealing with this. Um, and no amount of money can make suffering just go away the way that we can make a lot of other things stop or start very quickly, right? There's no silver bullet, so to speak, to end suffering. And what brought this topic to mind, uh, I was having a conversation earlier this week with a, a, a friend of mine um, who does some figure modeling. So she poses and, and people will, will, you know, draw her. <coughs> and so she'll have to stay in a certain pose for a period of time. And she asked me, hey, could you give me some advice on meditation to help, you know, maybe keeping some of these poses, uh, make it a little easier? Um, and I offered her some techniques. Um, I'm certainly, I have no experience in, in uh, you know, figure modeling. Uh, but I offered her some techniques for, you know, focusing her mind, um, counting her breaths, you know, resting her eyes on a fixed point, um, chanting mantras perhaps. Uh, visualizations as a visual visualization that I'm fond of when when sitting um, where I, I sort of turn myself into a mountain starting with my feet all then all the way up to my head um, because it can help me to stay very still and and you know we discussed in a practice or in a, a, a field like figure modeling you know you have to get into this pose and keep it for a period of time and they do have you know they, they cut it short so, so no one's trying to do it for too long, but when you start thinking, don't move, don't move, don't move, don't move, stay in this pose. then of course, now you start to notice all this stuff and it becomes very hard to do that. Um, but in chatting with her and sharing some of these techniques, you know, I, I, I realized like, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a practice though. Like you can do that and it might be sort of useful right away out of the box, so to speak. But for, for meditation practices to really make a difference and for you to experience that, it's something that you have to do, you know, repeatedly and with some effort. Because then after you've done it for a while, then it's something that you can kind of, you know, rest more easily in. And you can abide in meditation a bit more easily and quickly. Um, but it's not a, a quick fix, right? Not in the same way that Advil um, is or uh, Yelp for finding a restaurant, right? And <clears throat> here's the thing. Even a practice aimed at resolving suffering, like meditation, and, and you know, uh, most Buddhists who you talk to will, will have meditation be a part of their practice in some way, shape, or form. But even mindfulness meditation isn't a quick fix for suffering, as, as spiritual as it is. You know, and I love seeing uh, uh, Eastern ideas particularly eastern spiritual ideas pop up in, in western culture um, but sometimes we don't quite get it right right this, for instance you know we have this notion of achieving mindfulness just like ah inner peace or nirvana is just there and then we're one with everything and all of our problems go away um 
I was actually the other week I was watching Kung Fu Panda uh, 2 uh, on vacation. I love those movies. <laughs> but I have to admit that they have some some interesting representations of, of some of these spiritual concepts. Um, you know, the, the theme of that movie is inner peace, right? And one of the characters literally is meditating, you know, making a mudra and meditating, chanting inner peace to achieve inner peace. And, and Poe, the, the lead character, the panda uh, voiced by Jack Black, eventually finds inner peace, you know, and it gives him superpowers, right? And he's, he's, you know, they're shooting cannonballs at him and he's catching these cannonballs and throwing them back because he discovered inner peace, right? And again, don't get me wrong, I love those movies, but we we sometimes have this weird understanding of what mindfulness practice really is and how quickly it can come on and how quickly it can be effective. You know, and, and even as, a, you know, as I've referenced in previous talks, you know, I, I think we need to, I think it's very appropriate for us to give that same sort of um, consideration to the Buddha that, you know, we have this enduring image of the Buddha as being serene and, you know, in a constant state of bliss that, well, once he, you know, hit nirvana, he got it, right? And he was fine, you know, after the, the time of meditation under the Bodhi tree, after that, it was just all smooth sailing. But no, the Buddha was still human, right? So even for the Buddha, there was no silver bullet um, that, well, suffering's gone. Oh, I'm mindful now. You know, he still got sick. He still got toothaches. He still lost loved ones, right? If someone shot a cannonball at him. He wouldn't be able to catch it and throw it back. He'd need to run away, right? So, but I, I will say, though, that, you know, practices that develop mindfulness, they can help us to suffer less. Maybe not immediately, um, but, but they certainly can sort of lay that groundwork uh, for our practice and for us to do real work with our suffering. Think of mindfulness as uh, mental hygiene, you know, in the same way that you brush your teeth or weed your garden. You know, mindfulness can help us help our brains to be less cluttered, uh, less volatile, you know, a little easier to control, maybe slightly more predictable because we're putting in the work of mindfulness. We're creating that space, uh, that mental space through meditation. Right. And that matters. Um, because our entire reality, how we interpret the world, the choices we make as a result of those interpretations are all determined by our minds, right? It's a way that the Dhammapada opens up, right? All reality is from our mind. And the practices that we recommend within our, our community, um, the four, going through the four directions, asking ourselves the, the four questions, um, these are all helped along by mindfulness. And you've probably heard, you know, when we think about mindfulness, when we think about meditation, you've probably heard the analogy of uh, how mindfulness is like letting uh, sediment in a glass of water settle to the bottom, right? The dirt slowly falls to the bottom of the glass, and now the water is clear, right? And in the same way, that time and energy, and energy in the case of, of a glass of water is gravity, um, you know, time and energy that the, the glass needs time and energy for the water to become clear and the dirt to sink it takes time and energy for us to see clearly and to suffer less and to my knowledge um there's no magic pill or app or special 245 forty-five dollar cushion that can make water turn clear more quickly or make our suffering go away Right, but that doesn't, by the same token, stop people from trying to find that silver bullet, right? Um, you know, when, when people are experiencing mental anguish, they, you know, people will, will try to make that go away by drinking or taking drugs um, to help them think less about the things that are troubling them. I, I know there's a lot of um, study in psychotropics and mind-altering uh, substances that sometimes people you know say like hey this kind of this is a shortcut for mindfulness right it opens you up to a reality that you're often in your own way from experiencing right and that might give you a certain experience it could be very spiritually meaningful um, but it's still not that silver bullet 
to relieve suffering, right? Um, people will, you know, try sex to, to distract them, right? Um, play games to escape for a time, right? Uh, pick up hobbies to occupy their minds, you know, anything uh, to keep them from, from focusing on their suffering. Let me just push it down the road. Let me just forget about it for a little bit. But all of those escapes are temporary and they don't solve our problems they don't solve our suffering um, they just make us forget about it for a time so what does reduce suffering committing to working with it that's the start of the practice of reducing suffering right and in the same way that we may wish there was one thing that could make us enlightened, one thing that would, would reduce our suffering, the, the one thing focus should be on what is the one thing that we could focus on to start reducing our suffering? What is one thing that is causing suffering to us right now? And be specific. Is there a situation? Is there uh, something in, in our past? recent past or distant past uh is there an upcoming event right that's really hooking us that's causing us to get stuck and is is bringing suffering into our lives because it can be very tempting like oh i need to relieve my suffering i'm going to try to do the whole thing at once um it's really hard to do and that's why mindfulness is so important that's why meditation practice is so important because it creates a kind of mental expanse that allows for us to <coughs> pardon me take a look at the things that are afflicting us and ask ourselves okay you know as, as we we do in our our practices you know noting let me let me rate some of these emotions on a scale of one to ten which one is most afflicted and then i can go through the four questions on that thought and and try to break it down and understand it better uh, so i can make a change a creative change and that takes time, but it still is a focus on one thing, being very specific. Where's that one place that I can make a difference? <coughs> by working with that thing, by sitting with it, by uncovering the thoughts and beliefs associated with that thing that lead to suffering, we can learn to suffer less. It's not a silver bullet. Um... It's more like a silver path, right? It's a path that we walk that allows us to uncover that cause of suffering as well as other causes of suffering brought on by our conditioning. That's where the magic happens. It's not an instantaneous thing. It might be within the, the context of a longer journey, um, but it's not a pill. It's not an app. It's a practice. It's a path. And I know that I was poking fun at... <laughs> some of the the expensive mindfulness tools earlier um and again i'm sure some of them are wonderful um and and like i said they could very much be useful and and enhance our practice and have a lot of meaning if we integrate them into our practice um you know i have a lot of those tools i have bells i have you know incense i have malas and robes and things like that <coughs> But they're not a quick fix. They're part of a larger practice. And they're only useful if they get used. Right? Just buying a thing. Just buying a cushion. Just buying some incense. Buying a statue of the Buddha. Doesn't reduce your suffering. But they can be helpful if you use them. And they become a meaningful part of your life. And they can help you stay on that you know, silver path, so to speak. Because as you practice with these items, you know, the scent of incense can bring you back to oneness and remind you of that. Oh, yeah. You know, as I was as I was meditating, I was working on this thing and I burned that incense in a very meaningful way. I smell it now and it, rem it reminds me. Right. It reminds me of that healing. The sound of a bell, you use it in your practice. It can call you back to your true self and remind you help you and keep you on that path or even just looking at your meditation cushion whether it's a really expensive one that oprah likes 
<laughs> or it's, you know, one you made yourself or, or bought secondhand. That sight of the meditation cushion of that place, that axis mundi, right? That center of the, that center of the, the world for your practice can remind you that you're a Buddha. So I hope that these words have been helpful for you and your practice um, and wherever your path may be and wherever you're heading. The moment we receive true and trusting, solid and clear like a diamond, infinite light and life embrace and protect us, liberating us completely. Let us take the four immeasurable vows. Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to liberate them. Delusions are endless. I vow to end them. The way of compassion and wisdom are boundless. I vow to embody them. The way is unattainable. I vow to attain it. Let us take the precepts for the community of the vow. I allow my true self to manifest in all aspects of life. I take complete responsibility for my own life and all of my actions. I affirm my personal being and acknowledge it as a path to awakening and freedom. I embrace all aspects of my personal being, including my shadow, so that they may be transformed. I affirm an attitude of openness to my true self, even in the midst of suffering. So, I would like to spend some time, as, as we always do in these uh, liturgies, chanting. Uh, and tonight we'll chant the Nembutsu, um, followed by a brief period of silent meditation. Uh, so as always, I will knock on the Mokugyo uh, three times to start our chanting. And then uh, when I strike it three times again, that will be the last time that we chant. And then we'll spend some time in, in silent meditation, and then we will close. No.
let us recite the Bodhisattva's Gata. We dedicate this practice to the welfare of all beings throughout space and time. May it always be so. As always, thank you for spending some time with us this evening. Uh, I hope these words were helpful uh, for you and your practice. Uh, if you would like to learn more about us uh, and our practice or, or need someone to talk to, please visit us at AskSenseiTony.com or DragonflySanga.com. Uh, you can set up some time to, to chat with one of us. Um, otherwise, I hope that you have a great week walking that silver path and uh, look forward to seeing you again.